and we're live good afternoon or good morning good morning good day happy monday um my name is julian jean pierre i'm from the royal saint lucian cmos company and today i'm doing a live stream to uh talk about where they um where we get saint lucian cmos from you know where the areas are in saint lucia that um have the uh, CMOS. So um, I'm going to about to share my screen, but for those that are you know want to join in the conversation, I'm just going to post you guys um, some links into the comments here, so that if you want to join in the conversation, you can. And uh, just give me a minute, and I'll post them here. Uh, first link is going to be if you want to join in on the chats and get your chat seen on the screen you click this link uh, let's get it here and then the second one if you want to join in the conversation hey happy um, monday um my name is julian jean pierre we're going to add in these links you guys got to bear with me. This is I'm new to this this whole thing. This is um, you know just started this feature, but hopefully uh, we'll keep doing more of these live streams, and um, you know I'll get better and better at it as we go along. So hoping this is working. Once I get this started, I'm going to. Hey, Taeda. I think that's how I pronounce it right. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I always see you guys, you uh, sharing information in the uh, CMOS Club, which CMOS Buyers Club, which is awesome. You know, that's good. So hopefully, someone, some, some of you guys will want to join in on the, uh, the live stream. So, with that, let's overlay the chat here. Awesome. So, where am I here? Oh, you know what? I turned the volume down a bit. With that, let's overlay the awesome. chat. So, here. Awesome. So, Oh, you know what? I turned the volume down. Yeah, so awesome. let's overlay the chat. So here, awesome. So, oh, you know what? I turned the volume down. Yeah, so let's overlay the chat. So here, awesome. yeah. So, oh, you know what? I turned the volume down. Yeah, so let's overlay the chat. So here, that's what I gotta do. I gotta close these windows. All right, all right. So <laughs> this is going is a little crazy. Not uh, not being sure what to do exactly. So okay, I'm gonna share my screen now, and I am going to show you Saint Lucia. So here's my screen there. I'll send uh, Saint Lucia. So here you are looking at the island of St. Lucia. It's a beautiful island. Um, you know, it's, uh, you have the, up in the north, you have the um, Grosselet and Castries, which is, this area here is where the main, um, I guess, like, activity from humans is. Right, so the capital is up in the north. You look in the you see, you see a lot of humans up here, right? This is where all the the hotels are, all the beachfronts and stuff like that. They're all around here. There's even uh, an airport here. You know, this is where the ports are in Castries. This is the main um, 
I guess, the capital of the island. And so when you zoom out and you look, you will see that on the specific side and to the north, this is where most of the, um, how do you say it? Most of the, uh, the human activity is, right? When you start going down to the south, this is where most of the sea moss is grown or found, harvested, whatever you want to call it, right? So in the south end of the island, there's not a lot of development. The biggest town um, in the south is called Viewfort. And this is where the airport is. This is the town of Viewfort here. All right. And then if you go along the highway here, this is probably one of the only hotels in the area, Coconut Bay. All right. So if you notice, there's not a lot of housing. There's not a lot of like development in here. You know, all this area, most of the humans are right up here in the north, but they're not close to the shore and the water. A lot of the sea moss farms and everything start around here. Actually, I don't even think it's there. Let's see. Yeah, I'll know it from, from the stadium. So this whole area here is a protective mangrove. You know what I mean? So there's no homes, there's no humans, there's no not a lot of water running off into the beach and stuff. And the sea moss farms, for the most part, are all located in this region here. I wonder if I can draw a pen. I have to get used to this thing better. So it's all here, and it starts growing up more along this coast here. This is an area where a lot of sea moss is found. This is called Savins Bay. And so there's sea moss farms all along the side here, all here. This is where a big jetty comes up. So they, they do it here. And there's more farms over in this area and then all in this region. I wonder if I can zoom in closer and see if I can make, see if I can make this bigger. Hey, and don't make, don't forget to make sure you follow us on Instagram at St. Lucian CMOS. I do a lot of live streams there. And so you could see, um, uh, join in on the discussion. We'll talk about CMOS. So I think it's hard to see in here. Because you really would see a lot of sticks and stuff. But one of the things I want to point out is just how there is no, like, machines. There's no buildings. There's no, you know what I mean? Like, all this is, um, it's just like, how do you say it? Not abandoned, but it's just, you know, a lot of, um, there's no human interaction. Even right here, I don't know if you can see this in the mouse, but this right there, it that's like, I think that's an area where some sea moss farmers are and they have their tent. This is actually, I think, um, this white piece, that's where they're drying out the sea moss. I've actually been in that spot right there. So I'm familiar with it. All right. So the sea moss grows all along this coast here. Like I said, there's Savins Bay. One of the biggest, um, or most popular places, the, I guess the Mecca of sea moss, where some of the best sea moss comes from, is an area called Pralin. And Pralin 
is right around that's me could I think I actually passed it let me see there's mom recall there's problem so this right here is like the Mecca of CMOS farms this is where most of the CMOS farms is and actually if you look right there these are, are all CMOS farms they're kind of hard to see but if you see these little layouts these are the areas and as you can see there's no like humans in the area really there's no housing the closest like village here is right here and even then like there's not a lot of people there there's no hotels there's no sewage runoff you know this bay and it's very common peaceful if you could see over here and the mouse this uh is where the water sort of breaks and then inside here is just like a very you know um calm bay And then I believe there's more sea moss probably growing up in here. I can see is when you zoom in, you'll see these little areas. That's a sea moss farm right there, there. Let me see if any of you guys have any questions. So I'm just going to look at some of these chat questions and just answer them. That is true. Uninhibited and not overly populated. From... So once one Facebook user says, I can see them. It looks like the rice plant stations in Charleston, South Carolina from overhead. That's the slaves worked. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is where this right here to me is like the Mecca of, of CMOS, Prowlin Bay. This whole area here. That's where literally some of the best sea moss comes from. But this is not the only areas that I've seen people growing sea moss in St. Lucia. Um, there is some areas here on the northern side near Monchi over in this area here where they will sometimes have sea moss farms. And then also down here. On the south, on the other side of the island, near Labry Bay, there's seamouse farms in here. I wonder if we can even see them. You don't see too many. But I think a lot of them are capturing it out here in the low ending waters. I know we built a farm somewhere around here actually no it can't be there can't be there i think it was probably here we helped a guy build a farm here maybe it wasn't there so hard to tell it was off the side of the road and uh um I know it was off the side of the road and we had to go down a steep hill. So I think it actually probably isn't there. Where's the road? It's not that way. I think it was actually right around here. That's right. So one of the Facebook users said, are there any areas that sea moss can't grow? 
Um, that's a good question. I'm not too sure. Um, as far as I know, well, here is the honest answer. Moss can't grow in areas where um, there is a lot of, um, there's not a lot of salt water. Or uh, um, there's not a lot of, um, it has to have a certain the right conditions. And in fact, I'm going to pull up something that uh, I have that kind of talks about the um, the uh, sea moss and what conditions are required. This was a book that was put out by the um, St. Lucian um, government, or not St. Lucian, but the, um, it's an organization, Canary, I think it's called. It's like the Caribbean Natural Resources Institute. And so I'm going to share this with you guys. Stop sharing that screen. I'm going to share this with you guys. This, you guys, I think you're going to freak out. All right. Let me make it bigger so you guys can read it. And um, I have thumbnails. I just have there we go. So this is the Caribbean National Resources Institute Guidelines Series. And it talks about um, the cultivation of sea moss in the West Indies. All right. This is something um, I want to read a bit before I go into the actual um, document. You know, um, and it's the first one I want to share is called the biology of seaweed. And this is a brief biology of seaweed. Seaweeds belong to three main groups that can be distinguished by their dominant pigment. Sea moss species uh, such as Garcilaria and Euchinema are reds, and the other two groups are greens and browns. However, while the greens and browns are generally easy to recognize, the color of a species of red seaways may be different from one site to another, varying from yellow to light brown to purple. Genetic variants of some of these um, sea moss species may not have the red pigment and are bright green. That's the green sea moss that you see. The shape of the plant and the type of branching is affected by the water conditions, which adds to the difficulty in, in identifying um, many of these seaweeds. And see, that's part of the problem here is that it's very difficult to um, tell the like one species to the next when it's growing in these areas because a lot of them are very similar and they can change their sort of uh, genetic makeup depending on the water and the um, the the conditions um, so as most of the world's commercial seaweed species are reds or browns only reds are used in the Caribbean like all seaweeds they have no true roots leaves or flowers this is important guys like all seaweeds, they have no true roots, leaves, or flowers. Plants consist of branch fronds attached by a holdfast to a substrate such as a rock or dead coral. The holdfast anchors the seaweed but does not absorb nutrients like the roots of flowering plants. Let me make that clear again. The holdfast anchors the seaweed but does not absorb nutrients like the roots of of flowering plants. The entire seaweed plant absorbs nutrients that are dissolved in the surrounding seawater. This is an important feature in the farming of seaweeds as cutting from plants can be anchored to any substrate such as rope or nets as long as the water conditions are suitable. So this means that the sea moss can grow anywhere that it can attach itself to as long as the water conditions are suitable the, the sea moss will grow and um, it will, you know, be uh, highly nutritious and, and beneficial because the sea moss gets the nutrients from the water. It cannot get the nutrients from the rocks. Sea moss has a complex life history, which includes both sexual and asexual phases. There is an alternation of generations from identical looking male and female pants would produce grommets for sexual reproduction to other identical looking generation, which produces spores. In addition to the free-living plants which grow mixed in wild populations, there is a small 
parasitic phase that develops in the female plant. This phase can be seen in the reproductive female plants as uh, small bumps on the branches. So those bumps that you're seeing on some of the sea moss and you think that's making it look fake, those things are actually part of the reproduction phase and it's used to help, um, you know, put more sea moss, you know. This is, um, here's a comment here I just want to answer. It says, I once asked the seller about this and he has had absolutely no clue what I was asking him and I knew that I didn't want to do business with him. Well, that's unfortunate. But here's the truth. Some of these farmers... They're not super educated on sea moss. They're not super educated on the science of it. They grow it. They know how to grow it. They know how to dry it. They know how to make good sea moss. That's all that matters. You know what I mean? But they should really be able to tell you where they get their sea moss from, where it's being grown, and how. So another question here is: They mutate and evolve like all life forms. That is true. Not these. The sea moss is not all identical. You know what I mean? It's a living being this thing is going to look different every time it's like it's like humans no two humans are alike you know so thank you for those comments so um yeah so the the getting back to this thing it, it talks about the small bumps on the branches spores are released into the water and drift until they come in contact with a surface that is suitable for them to attach and germinate the settlement and germination of spores is the means by which the species spreads and colonizes new substrates. The most common substrates for spore settlements are rocks, stones, dead corals, and shells, but some species can be found growing on almost anything, such as discarded cloth, plastic, tires, ropes, bricks, and wood. While the plants are, um, are growing, they may change color. The amount of the red pigment in the plants is affected by the amount of sunlight that they are exposed to and the amount of nitrogen, which is a nutrient that they require, that is available. Bright sunlight uh, bleaches the plants to a pale straw color. A good supply of nitrogen, for example, from runoff after heavy rain, allows the plants to produce more of the red pigment. Thus, at any time, the final appearance of the plants is a balance between the effects of sunlight and nutrient availability. This is often seen on bushy lines where the upper plants may be very pale, but the shaded plants on the underside of the line may be deep red. If the shaded plants are also pale, then most likely has a low nitrogen available um, for the growth. Okay, so nitrogen is exceptionally important when they are uh, growing because they use the nitrogen to convert into the different minerals that they have. Okay, so now this is going into the talk about site selection when they're selecting the site to make sure that they have the proper nutrients for the sea moss. So the different sea moss species grow wild in a variety of habitats and it is not always possible to form, farm them in their natural habitat. On exposed windward coasts, where some of the Garcilaria species are harvested, the water may be too rough for installing lines on rafts or stakes. As the opposite extreme, very sheltered bays may not have enough water movement to keep plants free of sediment, particularly after uh, heavy rainfall when runoff from land carries large amounts of mud and silt into the sea. The sites that have been most successful so far have been on the windward coast where areas with shallow um, seagrass beds are protected by offshore reefs that reduce the amount of wave action. All of the species listed in this manual have been grown successfully in such sites However, there may be seasonal changes in the condition that affect growth during heavy rains in the wet season. Species such as Garcilaria can tolerate a drop of salt saltinality due to the freshwater runoff from a normal level of 35 um, parts per thousand, I think it is, down to 15. On the other hand, Euchinema, which is uh, much less tolerant of the lower saltinity, is best cultivated where the saltinity doesn't drop below 30 parts. Because of this, the likely variation of the conditions at a site and the requirements of the different species, it is only possible to give some general guidelines to selecting a site. I'm just going to go over this. There's some Garcilaria on the line. Here's uh, another Seamoss farmer. I actually know this guy, Ainsley. Very nice man. He is one of the original uh, farmers 
um, in CMOS. This guy has been doing it for decades. This is interesting. Grazers. It is important to not to try farming too close to the reefs where there will be populations of fish that feed only on seaweeds. Over seagrass beds, grazing fish will be a problem if the lines are too close to the bottom. White sea urchins or, or sea eggs live on living grass seagrass beds and they will quickly eat the sea moss on any lines that touch the bottom. Farmers in St. Lucia have occasionally seen turtles grazing on the sea moss in the far, and the, on their floating lines. So the sea moss in a natural state is food for a lot of people. And that's why it's important to make sure that um, we don't over harvest the natural sea moss that is in there, um, in the in the lines, I mean, in the, in the waters. This is a talk about the, the process of drying. I think a lot of you guys already know about the drying and the peaching. Here's them drying some on the sand, on the plastic bags. Here's them putting the sea moss on the drying rack. And if anybody wants a copy of this stuff, uh, of this document, I'm happy to share it. Here's some sea moss products. There's some people learning about the sea moss. And sources of the information. Some further reading. Marine plants of the Caribbean. Seaweed cultivation and marine ranching. And the annotated by bibliography of the seaweeds used for the foods in the West Indies. I'm going to check with some of these books. Is a sea moss recipe. So the question, is it better to tame sea moss from farmers that are certified through the St. Lucian Sea Moss Farmers Association, being that there are only 140 of them? First of all, I'm not aware of the St. Lucian Sea Moss Farmers Association. I'm only aware of, um, there's like three associations that I know that are registered in St. Lucia. Um, that is the Pralin Seamoss Farmers Association. There is the Opicon Seamoss Farmers Association. And then there's the Opicon Charcoal Farmers, or I think it's the Opicon, let me check. I'll tell you what it is. It is the Opicon Charcoal and Agricultural Farmers Group. And so those are the, the three groups that I know. And yeah, I, I do recommend that you, you try to buy from a farmer that's registered with the association, mainly because um, having a farmer that's registered with the association allows you to um, ensure that the sea moss that you're getting is from a variable source and is from someone that isn't stealing. There's a lot of theft of a sea moss on the island. And so I encourage everybody to um, ensure that they are getting their sea moss from a, a very viable source, um, from someone that, uh, whatchamacallit, let me see this. So he just sent a link. Can I look, hang on, let me see if I'm able to. You know, you put that link in and now I can't click it for some reason. But let me see if I can uh, do this. Uh. Hmm. Oh, no, here it is.
me share my screen. Where is that? Phone tab. I think this is the what he's talking about. Yeah. So this right here, what you're talking about, that's from the Prawlin CMOS farmers. And they're the largest um, farmer association in St. Lucia. And definitely I recommend if you can to, to buy your CMOS from them. But like I said, as, as long as they're a registered farmer from any of these groups, like um, we're, we're St. Lucian CMOS company, we're not a part of the Prawlin's farmers, but we still get good CMOS, right? And um, I mean, as long as they're from a registered uh, CMOS company, I think that, or a CMOS farmer, and they can show proof. Like one of the things we do is we always ask them, where's your farm? You know what I mean? And that's a really good indication of whether or not these guys are real or not. If they have a farm, they'll, they'll be happy to say my farm's here or I'm in this community or whatever. Um, for us, being that uh, my partner's on the island there, it's very easy for us to uh, to verify the source. But the CMOS is, um, there. there's a lot of problem with that and, it, and it's terrible. And, it, and it's really like these people work extremely hard to get this CMOS, you know what I mean? And so for people to, um, you know, steal it and try and make a quick buck, it's, it's a shame. Give me one second, guys. Um, I'm going to go and uh, I need to put my computer on charge real quick. Give me one second. back i just want to charge this so yeah if anybody is interested in um joining in in the conversation that, and you know we can share the screens and stuff like that let me know um i'm happy to um you know bring people into the conversation so we can talk more but i think before i left i was talking about the stealing and how um it is uh it's just a bad, bad situation. You know what I mean? Like a lot of people lose money. Uh, and sometimes it's like, it's bad enough that they don't just take the CMOS, but they, they, they take the CMOS and then they, they, they'll cut the lines. They'll throw the shit away. They'll, you know what I mean? Like they just cause so much damage and, and it makes it harder for that CMOS farmer to, to get back on their feet in a sense. Like it, it's it's bad enough that you took the CMOS, but you have to cut their lines too, and 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 this rope is it's not cheap, it's expensive, and it's discouraging. So there's people doing that. Um, we've caught uh, CMOS people trying to steal CMOS from us several times. CMOS stealing from other people. Um, there's constant um, just just people just you know. Um, accusing other people and stuff like that i guess that's what i the word i was looking for and so it's just not cool right so i really hope that people when you're buying your cmos especially if you're buying it directly from a source that you do the best that you can to ensure that the cmos that you're getting is from an actual farmer and is not from some just random dude that you met on instagram because at the same time you don't know what you're really getting you know what I mean? You don't know the condition that this guy kept the CMOS in, especially if he stole it. A lot of these guys that, that steal the CMOS, they don't know how to dry the CMOS properly. They don't know how to clean the CMOS properly. And so uh, is, um, you know, it's, it, it's, you, if you want good CMOS, you want someone, you want to get it from someone that knows what they're doing. So Candace Jones just said, uh, your CMOS is really good, but why is it not salty? Um, first of all, I want to say there's nothing wrong with having salt on your CMOS and some of our CMOS does come with a lot of salt. It is pretty salty. I think the type of CMOS salt is what's important. And depending on the farmer you go with, some of the farmers know how to 
on dry their sea moss or clean their sea moss in a way that it reduces the salt. Some of these sea moss farmers just take the salt off, really, before they get it because they know that um, a lot of buyers have issues with the salt. And so rather than just argue with them about why the salt's okay, it's just easier to take the salt off, right? And so that's that's what they do, you know? Oh, here's a cool thing. I'm gonna go back to sharing that. Um... So one Facebook user says, my CMOS never has added salt. It is naturally dehydrated, sea, uh, uh, sea salt water. So I keep my salt and use it to season my foods because it's full of minerals and vitamins. I 100% I agree with that. Um, for the most part, nobody that I know of in St. Lucia would even think of adding salt to their sea, sea moss that is the most ridiculous idea i've ever like like it just it literally makes no sense right why at like fuck you know what i mean salt is an added cost salt is not cheap it's not free so why add more stuff to the sea moss if it's not needed right the salt that's coming off that is it's just a naturally occurring salt and um it's a good sign it's you know sea salt has minerals in it there's a reason why we have um uh pink sea salt because it's supposed to have all these trace minerals there's no difference than that of uh, the sea moss um the, the salt that comes off the sea moss now one thing i'd like to add is that um if i were someone who wanted to use the sea moss salt i would make sure that i filter it to the point like because when you are getting the salt there's all kinds of debris in there and the sea moss salt is very fine, so it is possible to filter it in a way so that you reduce, um, you know, different pieces of grass, dirt, sand, whatever that might get into it. And I would—that's what I would be. Um, how do you say it? That's what I would be cautious of when putting it in my food. Now, it's definitely great to put into your water and soak in it, like Epsom salts or like a bath bomb and stuff like that. Um, it's good to put on your skin, your face, your hair, you know what I mean? Add it into scrubs and stuff. The sea moss salt, it's, it's, it's full of minerals. So the added salt is only on the goopy sea moss salt that you, uh, can easily find from the Asian markets for $2.99 or $4.99 a pound. Yes. I, I, well, here's the thing. I don't think that that sea moss had salt added to it. I think that's still the naturally occurring sea moss, but the way they dry that sea moss is, is dried in a way that causes the crystals to form larger. So the salt, because I believe that a lot of that sea moss is done in a commercial environment. And so if you had 50 tons of sea moss that you need to dry, it's not convenient for them to just spread it out on the sun and dry it. They'll put it in a, a machine to dehydrate it. Well, it's possible, my, my mind thinking, that if you have it in the dehydrator, that the, the, uh, the salt crystals will form faster because there's a machine that's actually pushing the drying process big, faster than natural. So the crystals would form bigger. I don't know. There's no, I have never did any proof to know that, but that's sort of like my logical uh, conclusion I draw, draw from. But you definitely don't want to get this kind of sea moss that's from the Asian food markets. Not because it's fake, but because it's just not good value. You know, at $2.99, $3.99 a pound, the pound that you get is like, if you compare it to the sea moss we sell, it's like one ounce of our sea moss equals like one pound of their sea moss because it's so wet and full of moisture that because they don't completely dry it, that it, it, um, it weighs more. And so you don't get good value. You know, that's my view of it, you know? And so um, the guy who said he uses it on the foods, um, the salt on his food, looks like he's saying he runs it through a strainer, which is great stuff. I'm happy to, to hear that. Um, the ones that I've found uh, seen flavors, either table salt or rock salt. I agree. And I think it has a lot to do with the, um, the way it's dried, you know? So, um, that kind of was all that I wanted to show today. Oh, that's, that's it. Now I'm getting back. I want to go back to this. 
last page that I was showing. Spore recruitment. This is pretty cool and interesting. Um, the best species for this method of propagation. Oh, I'm getting a phone call. Excuse me, one guys. Hello? Hey. Pardon? Yeah. Yes. Yes, you're, the, the reception's breaking up a little bit. But is it possible to uh, call you back in a few minutes? Because I'm just on a live stream and I'm going to finish it up soon. No problem. Thank you for calling. I'll call you back soon. Bye. Yes. Sorry about that. Busy guy. Always taking calls. You know what I mean? Uh, I got to make sure that, you know. In case anybody has any issues, you know, I'm there to help them. So, um, what did Candace Jones say? So I'm sticking with you guys with the exception of yours. Every sea moss I've tasted has been salty and taste fishy. Yours has no taste. It's wonderful. Keep up the good work. Thank you so much. But I'm going to be honest with you. There will be times that you'll get the sea moss that has a little bit of a fishy smell to it. Um, you might get the sea moss that has some salt in it. I mean, this is sea moss. You know what I mean? It's coming from the sea. So there will be salt because there's salt in the water. And there will be um, the smell of sea because it smells. But I, I know what you're talking about. And for the most part, the farmers that we buy from, I don't know how they do it. But the, the sea moss comes out with this like really nice, buttery, nutty smell. And it's just, it's very clean, the sea moss definitely that um you know i mean I, I can't argue with so getting back to the spore recruitment here um the species seems to thrive on moderate freshwater runoff and is often found in shallow protected bays near uninhabited areas growing on discarded materials such as cloth sacks tires and plastic these are ideal sites for spore recruitment but the seeded lines will then need to be transferred to a more suitable farm with less polluted water mm. interesting see there are areas where you can you know capture sea moss or harvest sea moss and it's in polluted waters like not all areas are great for sea moss you want to make sure that the water is so important where you get that sea moss you know the spore recruit the procedure for spore recruitment begins with anchoring empty lines and a dense population of the plants and waiting for the spores to settle, which usually takes about two weeks. The spores themselves are too small to be seen, but after they germinate, the sporlings should be visible after two to four weeks. Once the lines are seeded, they can be transferred to a monocultural site and attached to stakes or rafts, as described earlier for the lines. Interesting. So, beautiful document, um, you know, that uh, has a lot of great information on um, CMOS farming. And I think if people, you know, understood and learned more about the CMOS farming and how the CMOS is farmed, you'll see that it, it is really no, not like pretty much no difference than CMOS that's growing off the rocks or CMOS that's growing off coral. The only difference is that we use this to, um, we attach it to the ropes to, to keep it from floating away, but it, it doesn't, it doesn't get the material and the minerals from that. Um, it doesn't get the, the material, the minerals come from the dissolved, um, minerals in the ocean. That's where the nutrients come from, you know? And if I go back to sharing my screen, um, with the, uh, Google earth pro, you'll see that these areas are really like, there's like no pollution, you know? Just gotta zoom out here because I think I'm on a different side here. Let's 
thank you, thank you, thank you. And what's up? What's up? Good to see you guys all. I'm going to zoom in and show you. I if you can see some of the farms here, because I know there's some farms right here. See all this area here, see all this like green stuff. That's like where all like a lot of the sea moss is. It's all in these little areas here. Even like the wild naturally one, that's, that's where they're growing. You know, and this is all like shallow water, shallow bays. I wonder how low I can zoom in. Yeah, I guess the resolution is not good, but there's a lot of farms, CMOS farms in this area. All along here because they come off in this road here and they go along this road here like one of our CMOS farms is like right in this area here and if those that remember the story that I told about the, um, the the naked man I saw on the beach this was the road that we drove down and was basically going alongside here and I saw the guy running on the beach here, like going across here. And then when he came in, I think it was like right around here is where he dove in and we were like right there with the car to catch him um, stealing. And this guy was like buck naked, you know what I mean? Sitting there trying to steal the sea moss from all the farmers there. Uh, I think it was on a Friday afternoon. It was some day where they didn't expect to see most farmers to be. We just showed up and just caught them red-handed. Um, so one person here says, uh, I appreciate uh, your transparency and willingness to educate us further, further than basic knowledge. Um, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I think it's it's almost like part of my duty because I was, you know, I spent so much time in St. Lucia last year and met so many amazing people in the farming industry. And I saw firsthand, you know, the truth and what's really going on there and stuff like that. And I think it's important to share it because, you know, these CMOS farmers, guys, they work hard. Like they really, 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 I, I can't even be begin to describe how hard these guys work i think you know definitely have to go down there and show you guys so that you guys can get the gist of it but i'll give you like one sort of example and that is you know you see how uh far this this is from the main road okay i want you guys to you know put this into kind of perspective okay the main road is here, okay? See where this mouse is, right? Most of the people that live in the sea moss industry in this, say, this area here, they all live here, this Opicon, right? So they are carrying the sea moss from, let's say, here or even here. They are carrying it over to here a lot of times by hand they're walking okay let me let me repeat that they they are going from let me just move this so i can see this to you guys as i work they are going from here to here and they're carrying um the sacks and each sack usually weighs somewhere between 50 to 80 pounds Okay, and some of them are carrying two or three sacks at a time to save so that they don't go back and forth. Okay, out of that 60 pound sack that they carry, 
when they dry it after they've cleaned it so they've got to clean the 60 pounds they got to wash it and lay it out to dry they also got to bleach it first after they move that 60 pounds by the time they're done with it that 60 pounds is actually six pounds that they're able to sell so they lose it by a factor of 10 right so to get your 100 pounds they have to move a thousand pounds from here to here and a lot of or not even there up here where some of them live and a lot of them don't have cars do you know what i mean i mean some do i'm not gonna say like no one has cars but there's a lot of them that do this on their backs that do this all by hand and you know and that's not even we're not even talking about like them in the water cleaning the sea moss bringing the lines out into the water you know attaching them dealing with the currents and the waves and you know what i mean all that stuff and then there's like even sea lice in the water so as you're working with the sea moss there's bugs like eating you you know because you don't have like proper water gear to be in the water you know it's crazy so candace um just asked me he goes tell us more about the bleaching process okay well one of the things i think to do would be good if i'm going to talk about the bleaching process is to go back to um the um the document that i showed earlier and to say Candace says thank you for the education because everyone out there is selling it and many are not quality people need to educate themselves on what they're buying and putting in their bodies thank you thank you i agree this part of the reason why i'm doing it is to make sure that people understand that you know what i mean not all like all cmos is real but not all cmos is of the same quality or the same you know is taken with the same care and love i know cmos from saint lucia is just full of love i wish i had some right here now to show you this to, to just like once you look at it you see that there's love in that cmos um but i'm going to share my screen now with that document that i had earlier I should break close it. No. Let me just see here. I think it did close it. Let me share it. Okay. Let's go down back to there's a direction here talking about um, the bleaching process. So here is the process for cleaning. The first stage of processing is cleaning. The plants should be cleaned as much as possible in seawater while they are still alive. Once the plants have been dried, any mud or silt is much more difficult to remove without soaking the plants again. If the plants are washed after they've been dried, most of the nutrients uh, will be washed out and lost. Drying and bleaching are done in the sun. Uh, farmers in Sinu should begin in begin the process by laying the fresh plants in clear plastic bags and leaving them in the sun for a day see figure four or that's figure four so this right here is you know the sun's the sea must drying out um the inside of the bag heats up and the sea uh the heat bleaches the, the pigments in the sea moss sorry bleaches the pigments in the seaweed and dries off a lot of the water after this treatment the plants are spread out in the open, either on specially built racks or simply on palm leaves on the ground. And so here they are harvesting it on the on the on the racks here. It's very important to protect the plants from rain while they are drying, either by moving them to shelter or covering them with a a, a tarpaulin. A tarpaulin. This is particularly important with euchinema, which turns to porridge if it is rained on and can't be used again. As the plants dry, salt crystals form on the outside and must be removed by shaking. Any other impurities also must be uh, removed at this stage. The seaweed is now ready for sale. And so if you notice in there, they, they talk about the salt crystals on the outside and how it's naturally forming. You know what I mean? So this, this idea that the sea moss shouldn't have salt. This is a document that was, let me go back to the beginning here. This was produced like, like years ago. 
says copyright 1997 but i'm pretty sure the information was from from when they first started CMOS years ago It says, until the 1980s, all seaweeds used in the Caribbean were harvested from wild populations. However, like many other natural resources, the demand exceeded the supply and the wild stocks um, dwindled almost everywhere they were harvested. For this reason, the government of St. Lucia began a research program to develop methods for cultivating sea moss. The program began in 1981, and in 1985, a group of sea moss farmers made their first harvest from a farm on the southeast coast of the island. Since then, a number of individuals and families in St. Lucia have taken up seamounts farming as a profitable occupation. The technology has also been transferred to people in Grenada, St. Vincent, Dominica, Barbados, Antigua, Jamaica, and Haiti. Okay. So, some interesting information. And, uh, you know, it just shows you that, you know, we've been cultivating seamounts for a long time and they've known about the salts. You know, um, one person here says, uh, can you please explain possibly where people have gotten the quote pool grown from? I've seen, um, I've even asked these people, do they mean a tide pool or a pool? And they're saying a kid's swimming pool. Yeah. So I think that most of the, um, the, uh, the idea of this pool grown sea moss came from Dr. Savy. You know, and he discussed, uh, you know, sea moss growing in pools and stuff, and that's the stake. But I think that when he made those videos, that was like, you know, like when this document was made, it was like 20, 30 years ago. And a lot of things have changed then. I don't think that, that it's it's cost prohibited or it makes sense economically to grow sea moss in a pool because the ocean is free. And so um, I don't think there's really any pool grown sea moss, right? Some people have told me that there's some in the States and in, in, in um, Nova Scotia and stuff. But when I've looked at it, it's it's not the same Caribbean sea moss. It's usually Gar uh, Condorus crispus that they're farming. And they're doing it for an industrial um, purpose, right? To, to get the carrageen in for other food stuff. And this is, this is what I think people need to understand about the industry is that they're, you know, sea moss is used in thousands of products. It's used everywhere. And a lot of stuff, anything you see with vegan that has a thickener and stuff like that, it's generally the sea moss that's been used to extract either the agar agar or the carrageenan, right? And so because of this, we need to produce large amounts of sea moss on a, a massive scale. And these people that are producing the sea moss, they're not interested in these 92 minerals or whatever minerals and stuff. They're only really after one thing, and that's the carrageenan. So they're going to grow it and produce it to maximize that extract, right? That, I believe, is what causes the sea moss to not look as good as it would if we were growing it for the mineral, mineral purposes. I think that the sea moss like that is grown and, and dried in a way to, you know, maximize the agar and carrageenan. So it's going to be heavier and, and, and have more moisture in it. And it's, it's not going to look the same as what you would get from the Caribbean and stuff. And they sell this stuff cheap, right? Because these industries are buying it at megaton, the metric tons at a time. So you produce a product that is worth pennies of the pound. You're selling it to these major corporations that are buying them at tons. It's not, um, how do you say it? It's not a far stretch to think that it's possible for some of this sea moss that is really meant for these commercial industries to get diverted into the retail market. And that's where it's starting to show up. And I think that these people that are buying it are the grocery stores and stuff because they are they're looking at it from a purely business perspective. They're looking at it and thinking, okay, this stuff is 50 cents a pound. I can sell it for four dollars a pound and make good money. You know what I mean? And it's it, and it's an abundance. It's huge supply. The thank you. The um the sea moss that we cultivate are, and then we grow in St. Lucia, it's not it's not being produced on a massive scale or a massive level. Do you know what I mean? And so the cost is not going to be the same. It, it is, it's, it's more expensive. Everything is done by hand. Like I just showed you guys in the video how far these guys have to walk 
to fucking dry their sea moss. And so, you know what I mean? It, you, you can't, it, it, it's like, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges. You know what I mean? It's like this, you know, the sea moss that you get in those markets, that's a commercially made sea moss. Whereas the sea moss I find in the Caribbean, like St. Lucia, like Barbados, like Antigua, at like St. Vincent, they're more produced on a more, um, like an artisan level or, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, uh, it's not produced commercially. It's not used with machines. It's, 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 it's a more natural method, you know? So this Facebook user says, uh, yes, that particular product and is industrialized and used in sure boost milk subjects, select ice cream, select baby foods, vegan, marine collagen, beauty and hair products and dates back to the 1800s in Ireland during the potato famine. That is correct. I, I agree with you totally. And so there's a lot of uses for the sea moss, you know. I see a lot of people have joined me again. So I'm going to just uh, share my screen again and show you guys St. Lucia and where a lot of the sea moss is grown. So from my knowledge and experience and people, if any CMOS farmers are around, they can probably correct me if I am wrong, right? What is this? I just hit something. Interesting. This, I just hit the, yeah, the button in the corner I hit, what it did was it brought it back to like back in the days in 1985, they had satellite images in 1985. That's why the, bad ones. yeah, look at the quality. It's horrible. I wonder how I get that out. Oh, here it is. You can do a timeline. Yeah. You can see what it looked like in 2010. Actually, let's go to Prowlin. And see if we can see the um, the changes there over time. So here's Prowlin. That's two thousand and ten. Oh, that's Porcelain Island. Yeah, it's it's pronounced Prowlin. Prowlin? Yeah. Cool. And then let's see there, 2010, there's not a lot of uh, farms there. It's interesting to see that these different images yeah it's like they all have different qualities and stuff like that. yeah i think so this area here that's where a lot of the sea moss is and so those are like reefs right yeah that's all rocky reefs under there nice those yeah. are cool So that's what a lot. So it says it glitched out for some reason. Can you guys see me still? Yeah. So a lot of the CMOS industry starts probably even in this. Oh, no, I don't think that's Denry. So there's not really much CMOS in Denry that I know of. I think it starts kind of like around here on the coast and goes all the way down the side here. So Mon Repose, there's also Mikud. Just to crawl in. Let's 
Savin's Bay. I've been on this point here, BG Point. Nice so area. is this area in like Castries or like Viewport? Where is it? So it's in the southern end of the island on the Atlantic coast. I just, my child is here, just so you wonder who's asking questions. And so it's on the, this, let me zoom out here so you can see. So this is all of St. Lucia here, right? Yeah. This is the north end. This is where a lot of the um, businesses, this is the capital. So most of the inhabitants are all living up here. Everything here is sort of like sparse and, you know what I mean? Not heavily populated. Maybe except by here where the Pitons and and font Cijac. And so the sea moss is mainly cultivated in Mon Repos? In between, say, Mon Repos and Opicum. This oh. area here, all along this shed. That's a big coastline. Yeah. And if you see on the coastline, there's not a lot of people yeah. living there. Oh, yeah, because like a lot of it's like you rough, mountainous. Sure they haven't like go. developed housing over there. No, no. And then it's like where it is, it's like there, you know, there Can is you a. Zoom into the water and one of the bays. Yeah. Yeah, so like you see the different color, like you can like tell how much mineral you got, like just like smashing up against the shores of the island. Well, I think this with the different colors would signify the depth of the well, water. Well, yeah, but like, do you see like the shading? Mm -hmm. Like the shade the water is usually it becomes a more crystally blue once it comes gets closer to to land. Yeah, and it's cleaner. But you can see like the like you can see all the minerals and stuff mm -hmm. by just the color of the water. You see, there's not a lot of villages and areas mm -hmm. that they grow the sea moss. In. That's a little probably fishing village there. Oh yeah, because you got the road coming up right against it. Mm -hmm. So just zoom out a bit here. Hello, hello. I wonder if they can see me, guys. See or hear me. This is me, Kud. We go down the coast. Huntington Beach. I think this is, yeah, Sovereign's Bay. So I know a lot of people that farm in this particular area too, especially along this sort of coastline here. There's a lot of um, Seamoss farms. And they got them in the middle of the water here. And there's like reefs in there too, right? Yeah, see all this brown stuff here? These are all reefs mm -hmm. and rocks. Oh, I can see it because of the sun. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. So this is all the the reefs and the rocks in this area. All the brown parts, all the dark areas are generally like, you know, or lighter areas, I guess. I don't know. But there's a lot of sea moss farms, even right here. Like, see this area here? That's a staging point for sea moss, guys. Like if you, they're drying sea moss right there. And that's probably a car, mm -hmm. a guy going to the CMOS. Let me see how fast I can zoom in. 
I don't even think that's so road. I think people just drive down there so often. No, it's a like it's a well, it's not a, a physical road. It's like a dirt road. Yeah, like a path. That's what I mean. Like you got enough cars driving down this one area long enough, mm -hmm. you create your kind of own road. And that's kind of like a hill. So this is on top of a hill, and that's lower to the bottom. I wonder if there's I can do this. Yeah. Oh yeah, if they take them down there. So let's see, it's like a giant slope. Where yeah, it is, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard. Exit the ground, and then even to get here, like you really, some people walk it, but you can really only get it by car. And even with the car, you have to have like a serious four by four vehicle because I think it's here or somewhere where it's like the road is like friggin' insane. Like the shit that these guys do with their vehicles to get to these places is like, I am like in awe. I'm just like, what? Like going up giant cliff, you know? Yeah. So here's another example of how far these guys have to go. This is the road here. There are people that have to walk here, down, down here over this hill to get to right there that's where they do their sea moss oh yeah that is such a long walk yeah it's like several kilometers it is not easy and they're carrying sea moss on their backs americans yeah. could never yeah these guys don't know they quit so fast so here's another area too where they have a lot of sea moss growing mm -hmm. in this area here and here you know it looks like they got some like, really good reefs over here. Yes, and this is Coconut Bay. So where our farms are located is like right around here. And it goes like, there's all kinds of seamless farms right there. Oh my God. Yeah. Paula from California. Hey, what's up? Amelia, I'm I'm currently right now in Toronto, Canada. So holler from, from the T dot, you know, and um, make sure you guys follow me on Instagram and on Facebook. You just look search St. Lucian CMOS, but I'm also on YouTube. You search the St. Lucian CMOS company. And I'm going to start doing more videos on YouTube, going into more uh, details about CMOS and uh, how CMOS has grown, dried. I'm going to invite some CMOS farmers to come on here and talk with me, and, and we discuss CMOS and stuff. And I think it's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah, I'm excited about that. Get away here. Shoe. Shoe bug. Oh, right. These wasps really think they'd be out in the backyard. Yeah. So hold on now. Americans could please learn the history of what our ancestors went through on slave planters. I, I take offense to that. I'm not sure what he means, but I think maybe he's upset because I said Americans and he, you know what I mean, um, wouldn't do that work, but like some Americans were well, like yeah, slaves and plantations and stuff. When I say Americans, I mean like all North Americans. Like compared to the people who live on the islands, we are really weak. Like we're so like used to like living basically in the laps of luxury that when any actual hard work comes around, the like we're just so not used to it. No, you, you bring up a good point. And I remember watching a documentary where they showed, um, they were talking about uh, Mexican immigrants coming to work on their farms and taking their jobs. And then what they did as an experiment was they got a bunch of Americans and basically put them on the job to see how they would fare compared to these um, migrant workers. And most of these Americans like quit within the first hour and was like, hell no, we're not doing this. This is not worth the money that I'm getting paid. Yeah. And, and I think that's where you're trying to make the point. And I agree with you is that I don't believe that any North American would do the like well let me put it like this way if most americans were to do the job that these guys are doing in st lucia they would respect 
and 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 be willing to pay more than what they expect to pay the CMOS. A lot of people think the CMOS is free and that it's done with little to no work. Like we just pull it out of the water, snap our fingers, and it's CMOS. That's not the case. It's a lot of work. And I don't think that um, most people would be willing to do that level of work for the for the level of pay that most CMOS farmers are getting nowadays. And, it, and it's getting scary because it, people are trying to get it lower. And I don't understand how lower they want it to go or expect it to go. Listen, I... I'm an entrepreneur. I've been doing business for a long time. I can tell you this right now. You want to make more money? Getting it for a less price is not the answer. The answer is to sell more CMOS. Okay? Stop trying to get it for cheaper. Right? Start trying to sell it for more. And then when you sell more, you can go back and, and try and get it for cheaper. But it's like they're doing it ass backwards. It's like they want it cheaper so that they can sell more. That doesn't make sense. And, it, and, it, and it's costing at the at the expense of the farmer, which I think is wrong. You know what I mean? They did their part. We need to do our part and just sell more CMOS. And everybody's going to win. You'll make more money and the CMOS farmer will make more money. Stop trying to squeeze the CMOS farmer to make those extra few bucks. If you if you hustle hard, you can double your sales. And, and there you doubled your profit. And, and you didn't have to do it at the expense of squeezing the CMOS farmer. You know what I mean? So Candace Jones says she's correct. Uh, we could never live like that. First off, our bodies. First off, our bodies couldn't hold up. We are also nutrient deficient. <laughs> right? Like you think you think the St. Lucians walking down that job, You think they care? No, they walk that and they walk it with pride. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's good. So it looks like I've been running this live stream for about an hour. Or so and I got my buddy Mason there chilling and so uh i'm gonna ask a few more questions but i'm gonna i'm gonna tap it off i don't want to do it too much of a you know be on here for hours and hours and um pick up everybody's time definitely if you guys have more questions put the questions in the comments and i will follow up and answer them and read them and let's hope we can uh try and organize or arrange to do more of these uh live streams like this i'm gonna pick out another topic to talk about cmoff for the next time um, if you guys have anything you want me to talk about, that would be great. You can put that also in the comments and I'll help. Um, here's a question that just came up or comment. It says, that is not the same in comparison. I work in healthcare and refuse to work that type of labor. My great grandmother did, uh, did it for enough for 150 a week and lived to tell her great grandchildren her story, um, at 91 year, uh, years of age. Definitely uh be try to be public i think they meant trying not to be not trying to be political oh trying no, definitely not trying to be political yeah i think i cut it off before like, yeah yeah um so or, oh I, hang on there's more to it yeah i think yeah my point was a little misconstrued i think what i was trying to say is like st lucian's work hard and us in north america us people in north america we're used to just like over productionize a lot of like technologically advanced stuff helping us out these people in st lucia they're working with their hands they're working with their heads and they put a lot of effort into the team moss and to treat it like it's some over serialized and commercial product is paying a disrespect to them definitely definitely cool. <laughs> so he said uh definitely it was misconstrued i would stop while i'm ahead sorry it, and i you know what it's hard sometimes to read the comments while you're trying to do the show and, and watch There's so much going on in my if you can see my screen now i got like 20 windows open up so i i want to apologize if i did misconstrued it or not understand uh what you were trying to say but um the point is it's hard work whether Americans can do it or not, that's besides the point. The fact is, is that it is back-breaking labor. And I feel that, you know, um, we're, we're, in a, uh, we're starting to move into a, an area where I feel like it is, it is not good for the farmers. And, and I see in the market people trying harder, you know, always trying to find ways to 
you know, um, reduce the, uh, the, the price of the steam loss. And I feel like, you know what I mean? There's a lot of other ways to increase profit than having to do it at the, at the expense of, um, the person that's doing majority of the work to get that steam loss to the market. It's something about the young lady in the back. It was the young lady in the back. That would be you, I guess? Yeah. I'm not sure what she meant. I think she meant, like, I didn't... Ex I think what happened was I didn't explain what I meant properly. And so it was misconstrued and taken off as being rude to, like, the people on the island uh -huh. and their family. Mm. Okay. Fair enough. All right. Well, I think I answered most of these questions and um, I do got some work to do today. So I'm going to let you guys go. And um, like I said, thank you for watching. Thank you for being a part of this and participating. Please, you know, continue um, to have the discussions in the comments. And I'm going to follow up with these um, with the comments and do my best to try and answer anything that I missed. So this Facebook user says, I think that even if you pay attention into the CMOS groups, there are tons of people trying to undercut people like um, undercut people like you that are credible, that show improve, um, show improve where you get your CMOS from. They're, they always say the cheapest CMOS. They always say the cheapest CMOS, the cheapest CMOS gets ours. And then this person said, cheaper is never better. I agree. I don't believe that um, that cheaper is better. Um, I mean, it's good to get things for a good price. And it's good, you know, to make money. And I, and I do believe that as you um, increase the volume of what you're selling, you know, there, there should be opportunities to get price breaks. But a lot of people don't realize that when you're dealing with the CMOS at the source and you're buying directly from the farmer, there is no price breaks for us. Whether we buy it for a thousand pounds or five hundred pounds, we really don't get it less. The market price is the market price, and so sometimes it's difficult for us to reduce the, the price on volume because you can only reduce it so much, right? So another question from Candice says: Is the purple CMOS better? Ugh, it depends what you define as something better, right? Uh, I think that all CMOS is good. I feel that the purple it has a lot of nutrients and um, micronutrients and enzymes and um, what are they called? Not nutrients, but amino acids and stuff that are different than the gold, right? The gold through the process of bleaching washes a lot of those nutrients out and stuff, but that doesn't often mean that it's better. I find that the purple sea moss is harder on your body and so it could be more damaging over long term if you're using it consistently at a high level in comparison to the gold CMOS. So for me, I recommend people take the purple as uh, something to occasionally when they need an extra boost or, you know, something uh, pick me up or, you know, say they, they've done a few weeks where they weren't um, eating clean or, you know what I mean? They're just feeling like shit. The, the purple might... Uh, Yes, and of silence. Um, the CMOS is going to, uh, the purple and stuff will, you know, give them like a boost. But I'm not sure if it's great. You know, I could be wrong, but I don't personally take it every day. I take the gold every day. And I feel that it's, it's definitely easier on my stomach than the purple and, um, say, the green. You know? <laughs> Look at me, shit. What are we doing, Mason? We're just chilling. This guy lives the life. You know, lazy dog. So purple fruits and vegetables are rich in anthocyanins, which are natural plant pigments that provide food with their unique color. Registered dietitian booking rights for WebMD studies have shown that anthocyanins may benefit uh, brain health help to lower inflammation, fight cancer, and heart disease. Interesting. Nice. And I, and I think I, I need to make some time to kind of further 
examine the use of the colors and how they affect um, our bodies, you know. Hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys, for participating. I am going to start ending this, live, this stream now. Again, make sure you guys um, check us out. Follow us on, on Instagram. We are on St. Lucian CMOS. On Facebook, we are at St. Lucian CMOS. And if you search St. Lucian CMOS Company on YouTube, you'll find us. I have a couple channels there. One is called CMOS Talk. I recommend you uh, join that and subscribe to that. And also subscribe to CMOS Life. We're going to start uh, releasing a lot of videos of um, CMOS farmers and guys that are working in the CMOS industry right on the ground. And that's going to show you the life um, behind the scenes and, you know what I mean, just give you like an inside look at life with CMOS farmers. So that's going to be on CMOS Life. Make sure you guys subscribe to all of that. And then comment here just said, cheaper is better. No, that's not it. Here it is. Your dog is so adorable and so well behaved. He is just living life. Yeah, he's behaved when he wants to be. You know what I mean? He's but, also a menace. Yeah, he can be a big menace when he when he when he wants to be. I kind of um, compare him to like an old college frat boy or something like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yes, thank you guys for watching, and I'm hoping to be back soon. This is Julian Jean Pierre from the Saint Lucian Seamouse Company. Um, please, when you can, uh, check our, our website out at www.stlucianseamossecompany.com or www.stlucianseamoss.co. All right. And with that, I hope you guys have a beautiful Monday and thank you. Yes. And be blessed. <laughs>